And so what is a bigger threat to sustainability, social and ecological? Uh, resource scarcity, running out, or overconsumption? And this is where we are headed. So this brings us to sort of a new topic, which we'll start and pick up with after the first exam, um, culture of consumption. One of the reasons behind increasing consumption rates, uh, there, these trends, we're consuming more than ever. Stuff is bigger, there's more variety, more choices, is this culture of consumption. So remember our Brundtland report uh, definition of sustainable development, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the future to meet their own needs. It's, this is a very ambiguous definition. Um, what are needs defined? What is a need? What are the needs of people today? What are the needs of people in the future? Um, and are our needs always expanding? One of the characteristics of the culture of consumption that we live in is marketing, advertising. Um, people with lots of money have a vested interest in convincing the broader population that you need this or you need that to truly be happy, right? Of, create, of creating ever expanding needs and wants and desires. Um, our economy literally runs on consumption. That's, that's what you hear when politicians are talking about economic growth and um, tax breaks for the wealthy. It's to sort of cut people a break so they can spend money and stimulate the economy so they can go buy stuff. And so a key question to sort of keep in mind is why, why do many of us in the US need things that go way beyond human necessity? And so what is, what is your most important need? Um, not that, but is it food? Is it water? sex, reproduction, sleep, probably all of us need a little more of that right now, um, excretion, an iPhone, right? What is a need versus a want versus a desire? And these often in the U.S. get conflated, right? Wants versus need. What do we actually need? And why do so many of our needs here in this country go way beyond human necessity? Uh, let's look at some trends around consumption. So about 20, 25 years ago, uh, you could buy a couple of different barbecue grills, right? And most of them looked just like this, right? A couple of places to set some stuff, a fuel source, all that kind of stuff. Home Depot, a couple of years ago, 88 different models ranging from 99 bucks to 2,500 bucks. Um, it illustrates a trend we're seeing across the board. There are more stuff, it's bigger, and there's more choices. Um, this is the Summit S670 for $2,500, bucks, right? It's got all these different characteristics that I don't want to spend time reading through. Stainless steel flavorizer bars, a Snapjet individual burner ignition system, lighted control knobs, da-da-da-da-da. And more recently, I think I looked this up last semester, you can get even nicer barbecues now um, up to, I think the highest is about $7,400. That's like getting close to half my annual income. Um, why, why is there so many, why, right? Why is there so many choices? And it has to do with marketing. It's, um, it's kind of a trick, it helps shape our choice. And I'll come back to that in just a minute. And so the barbecue example is part of a larger trend in industrialized countries like our own. Um, ever increasing levels of consumption. On the chart, you can see historical perspectives on energy consumption per person, per capita. And so if you look at the far right, this is sort of way back in the beginning of, of when humans first evolved. Um, the, before people started using fire, they basically had access to the calories they ate. That's how much energy they consumed, right? So 2,000 kilocalories, a kilocalorie is a food calorie. Uh, about 2,000 calories, that's your daily energy requirements or something like that. The first fire users, like a million years ago or so, they used a little, about two times as much energy, burning a little bit of wood, which releases heat also um, for cooking. Hunter-gatherers used maybe twice that amount of energy as the first fire users. Uh, 
new methods for food preparation, still using fire, burning wood. Farming, farming predecessors use something like three times the amount of energy of hunter gatherers as they start capturing sunlight through the crops they're growing. Also sometimes harness a little bit of wind power, maybe use some animals um, in drafting. So a little bit of animal power in farming. Industrial societies, the industrial technological man of 1970 in the US uses something like 230,000 kilocalories per day. So from 2,000 kilocalories, the food you eat, up to the average person in the US in 1970 using over 200,000 kilocalories per day of energy. The amount, that's 115 times um, sort of the first fire user. That's how much more energy we use per person per day, right? It has in increased enormously and really only in recent time periods. And one of the main things that changed was the industrial revolution allowed us to use fossil fuels. We were no longer limited by nature's natural energy flows, sunlight, soil fertility. We unlo unlocked this storehouse of energy. And it's not equally distributed. Not everyone around the world is using 230,000 kilocalories of energy per day. And on that note, out of the 230,000 kilocalories per day used by the average person in the US, 1970, today it's about 235,000. About 26% of that, of that 230,000 goes to electricity. About 10% of that 26% is useful electricity actually used. 16% of it is lost through inefficiencies in the system. And it's not equally distributed. From your reading for today, Bodley talks about in 2003, you had 10%, just a tenth of the global population using almost half of the global energy budget, almost half the energy on this globe. Even though the average US person uses 235,000 kilocalories per day, the median per capita consumption globally is only 24,000 kilocalories. So 3 billion people are using less than 24,000 calories a day, and 2 billion people are living on less than 12,000 calories a day in terms of energy use. Um, too many people and not enough resources, or do we have a distribution of consumption problem? Things have gotten bigger. There's more choices than ever. Um, when cars first came out, there was you know, a couple different maybe models at some point, but nothing like the variety we have today. Does anyone know why SUVs were originally created? Does anyone know the original reason for the creation of the SUV? SUVs were designed for people that lived in areas that were rugged, that were difficult to get to, that dirt roads or maybe rocks or what live in the mountains. Um, and so it was designed for these people to actually get home and leave their homes. Everything else was sort of tacked on after as part of marketing. And oh, look, you can have this convenient space, luxury, you can carpool, you can do all this other stuff. It was just a way for people to actually get where they lived because they lived in rugged terrain. But then you can sell them for all these other reasons, right? And they're safer in traffic and you can see over people and all this other stuff that came later. Houses on the left, that's the average single family home being built in the 1950s, about the size of it. 50 years later, this is the average size of the single family home in the 2000s, right? Is this progress? Portion sizes. Um, when Coca-Cola first came out, it began, and so the cup on the left is the original size, portion size of Coca-Cola, about 6.5 ounces, and they don't really make, I guess they make little tiny cans now, but for a while that size wasn't even made anymore. Um, then it went to 8 ounce to 12 ounce, and then even the bottles, the 20 ounce, the 2 liter. Earlier on in the 1900s, there wasn't different sizes. If you wanted popcorn, you ordered a popcorn. If you wanted fries, you got fries. If you wanted a soda, you got a soda. You didn't get a pick between a small and like a super gallon ultra super size. Um, and this different sizes emerge from a marketing trick, a bit, a, essentially, to get people to consume more, meaning buy more, meaning increase the profits of the company selling this stuff.
And so I think you'll actually read a little bit about this uh, in a few weeks. There was uh, some, this guy that owned a movie theater. This is back in like the 40s and 50s, I want to say, maybe even 30s. Um, I don't know. I'm not that old. He was, you know, that's where they make all the money, right? The concessions, the popcorn, the, the overpriced soda, not the movie ticket. And so the owner was trying to figure out how do I sell more popcorn? Um, and he can see people, you know, licking the bottom of the popcorn bag. He knows they want more, but they won't buy another one. Right. And they, so tried some different deals, you know, buy one, get another one for really cheap or whatever, but people would only buy one. So the social scientist gets hired and he's doing research on how to get this guy to be able to sell more popcorn. And what the social scientist said, I can't remember his name right now. Um, it's something he called like the gluttony principle. And so people, uh, this is just the results after talking to people, what he found of why they wouldn't go back and get another popcorn. Um, they felt piggish, if you will, or sort of gluttonous, like you already had your one serving and then they almost like shameful to go get a second one. Um, social perceptions, right? But, but if you can sell someone in, in one sale, a larger portion, they will buy it. Right. And the same people at McDonald's sort of licking the crumbs out of their fry bags. They can tell people want more popcorn, more fries. They won't buy a second one because it makes them feel like gluttons. And so the researcher told the popcorn guy to do this. He didn't do it for a while. Eventually it got instituted and made him a ton of money. This is where the different sizes, this research eventually made its way into McDonald's. And this is where the different sizes come from. And so for those that just pretend this is something you drink, maybe you don't drink soda and, you know, it's probably good. Pretend it's kombucha or whatever, um, you know, vodka, whatever. Who would buy um, sort of the smaller one versus the larger one and why? Usually a larger size is a better deal of the price. Exactly. And so this, it costs you, it costs the company fractions of a penny to produce that larger size. That can versus that two liter, it costs them literally almost nothing. But the consumer's paying another 16 cents or 60 cents or $1.25 for that. So it's a better deal. They're getting more than they would for less of a price than if they bought the smaller one. But it costs the company almost nothing to make that larger size. So it's a way essentially to get us to consume more than we otherwise would. They create these different sizes, these different choices, and then make the bigger ones a better deal, a better bang for your buck, right? And so company costs the company almost nothing, but they're making tons of profits every time someone buys that larger size. Sort of, it's a marketing trick. It shapes our choices. One of the results of all this increased consumption, houses, cars getting bigger, um, people have recreational vehicles bigger than my apartment. One of the results is North Americans, especially the US, we lead the pack in CO2 emissions, right? The byproduct of all that consumption. Uh, on the left, if everyone consumed at the same level of, as the average North American, we'd need nine Earths to absorb the emissions coming back out to prevent dangerous climate change. We'd need nine times the Earth's capacity to absorb that if everyone consumed at the levels the average US person does. If you look at the right, you can see average CO2 emitted per capita by country. The US leads the pack, we're around 20 tons. Um, China on average is around four, maybe five tons today, but their population is much larger than ours. Right. So an iPad, remember, all of these factors go together. It's not just how many people, but how much are they consuming? What's their technology? Is it allowing them to consume more? Is it reducing impact? They all come together to re sort of create the overall outcome. And, um, and don't worry about this, but we just recently passed the 400 parts per million threshold. So I was just showing you we need nine Earths to absorb the levels that if everyone emitted at the same levels as people here. Um, in 2016, for the first time ever, we passed permanently the 400 parts per million threshold. Um, 
measure of atmospheric carbon concentration. And it was, it's in September when levels are supposed to be as low as they get because we've just passed spring and summer, all the vegetation's been growing, soaking up carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So by the end of summer, before leaf drop, this is sort of when levels are at their lowest. This is the first time ever we never dropped back below that 400 parts per million and we're probably never coming back down. Why? Um, and I'm gonna go a little bit quickly because what we care about here is the trend, which is we are consuming more. So I have a little bit of data to show you. Don't worry about the particulars of this graph. Um, we're driving more, not, not just for work and other things, but also recreationally. This shows house size. It shows from 1973 on the top to 2004. But what you see, and it's broken down by sort of region across the country, um, both median and average square feet, houses have increased by like 50%, the average of about 1,500 square feet to you know, 2,500 square feet. The new single family homes being built, they're being built larger. Uh, not just bigger, but with more appliances too. So same time period, 1973 to 2004, um, on the so sort of the first three columns, it shows houses being built um, with air conditioning. And so in 1973, maybe 50% of the houses were being built with AC in it, these appliances that also require fossil fuels to run. By 2004, about 90% of new single family homes being built were, had included AC units. Only about 10% didn't. So we're just, we're consuming more, we're buying more, we're using more. Parking spots, 1971 to 2004. Look at the, the one and two and three car garages. So this is house, houses built with a one car garage, two car or three cars. And you can see houses with one car continually decreasing because people during this time period, a lot more families started owning two cars. Um, two cars increases. And then houses being built with room for three cars in the garage, that's not even a thing until the 90s, right? Then those start being built. Carports are going way down throughout this time period. It shows this emphasis on these single family dwelling units versus multi-residence use. And the more single family homes you build, the more spread out and sprawled it is, the more infrastructure that requires, the more consumptive it is. In a lot of cases, um, our choices are limited. And so we need to pay attention to that too. Um, how many of you, when you have to get somewhere, drive to where you're going? A lot of you, the majority, driving's the main form of transportation. And for many of us, whether it's because we have time constraints, it's too far away, we have other stuff we have to do, pick up kids, um, it's convenient, driving is the most convenient means for us to do what we need to do. This is not an accident, right? Public transit in this country used to actually be pretty good in our major cities, so that nine out of 10 people took public transit. And I mentioned this before, and I'll come back up again, so just real quickly, in the 1940s, a company called National City Lines, which was actually owned by GM, Firestone Tires, and California Standard Oil, now Chevron, created a company, National City Lines, and they bought up public transit in 100 major cities, including LA, including San Diego, and they slowly dismantled it purposefully. They were actually convicted of monopolizing and conspiracy to, to do this. Um, I think they were fined a dollar, the main mastermind behind it. But they destroyed it um, to make room for cars because nine out of 10 people there took awesome public transit. They were never gonna be car owners. They literally got rid of public transit to make way for the open road. Um, all that shit about it, driving being convenient, it didn't used to be, right? They made it that way. So that alternative modes of transit aren't convenient for most of us. It's not an accident, right? It's been created that way. Um, and so we also have to pay attention to the way the system's structured, the way in which our choices are shaped and limited. Even if we want to be more sustainable or take an alternate transit, we often can't, right? China, um, car ownership's on the rise there. Between 2007, 2011, 1,500 cars were being added to the streets each day. This is from 2015. Um, in just 2014, 150 million cars were added. 
we are consuming more and other countries that are developing are starting to reflect trends that we see in our own country. And so remember our iPad equation, this useful way for understanding the multiple factors that articulate to create overall impact, human impact on the environment. So I being human impact on the environment, P population, and impact is a combination of population, affluence, which is a fancy word for consumption and technology. And trends now indicate consumption, excuse me, is just as important as population, right? If not more important. Until recently, a lot of concerns about sustainability focused on population. Why? Population growth is a little bit easier to quantify. We can look at birth rates and death rates. Um, Consumption is more difficult to measure. Is it numbers of songs on your iPhone? Is it apps? Is it clothes? Is it CO2 emissions? How do you measure consumption? And different disciplines have different definitions, right? The physicist, consumption is what happens when you transform matter or energy. The ecologist, what big fish do to little fish. The economist, what consumers do with their money. Um, the sociologist, what you do to keep up with the Joneses. And this is getting closer to where we're going. Sort of a lot of people in this country consume in part because the stuff is useful, but also because these consumables, clothes, cars, houses, send social messages about who we are. Why was consumption ignored? And it goes back to Malthus. For over two decades, the same frustrating exchange has been repeated countless times in policy circles. A government official or scientist from a wealthy country would make the following argument. The world is threatened with environmental disaster because of the depletion of natural resources or climate change or loss of biodiversity. And it can't continue for long to support the rapidly growing population. To preserve the environment for the future, we need to move quickly to control the global population, especially in the world's poorest regions where most growth is occurring. The developing world would remind us, um, if the world is facing environmental disaster, it's not the fault of the poor who use few resources. The US is less than 5% of the global population and uses like 30 to 40% of the resources. The fault must lie with the world's wealthy countries where people consume the great bulk of the world's natural resources and energy and cause the great bulk of its environmental degradation. We need to curtail overconsumption in the rich countries which use far more than their fair share both to preserve the environment and to allow the poorest people on earth to achieve an acceptable standard of living. Consumption is just as, if not more important. Don't worry about the data, but what you're seeing is consumption rates, meat, milk, seafood, all growing faster than population. Forestry consumption, all growing faster than population. Um, we'll come back to that later, but tech Technology can make things better, it can make things worse. And so what this shows is fuel efficiency got much better over several years. You can go the same distance on less gas. The result has not been people consuming less, but buying more cars and driving further and faster, right? That T only helps mitigate impact if the consuming behavior doesn't increase. If it just allows us to consume more, we've done nothing to reduce impact. And so where we're going is all this increased consumption is related to this rise of consumer culture, um, where sort of the stuff, uh, the commodities are about more than just the thing, the use of that thing. It becomes about what the object symbolizes. The key takeaway, the object of consumption, the thing you're buying, it's valued not just for its use, but what it signifies to everyone else. The brand name, right? The purse, the type of phone. Um, and this is one of the ways in which the elites get us to continue to consume. The story of stuff is going to talk about this. It's going to kind of pick up where we've left off uh, about this. Do the film reflection. Don't forget about the exam and reach out to me if you have questions, you want to talk about the material, all that good stuff.